my fear about AI disrupting marketing is less about people not having jobs or let's say copywriters being out of work because AI will generate all of that magic copy by themselves. It's less about all of that stuff and more about, you know, making us a lot more complacent. I, I think what it really means is that our value as humans, we really have to upskill and upgrade ourselves. I don't know who said this. The jobs that AI will take away isn't all of those people that I mentioned, not the copywriters and so on. I mean, but really the people who are using AI will take away jobs off those who are not using AI, I feel. Every SaaS company plays for high stakes. But what does it take to dominate the market right now? Welcome to Paris Talks Marketing, the podcast where we dive deep into the latest trends and strategies in SaaS marketing that are really working today. I'm your host, Paris, and our guests are SaaS CMOs, founders, and specialists, and we discuss one trendy topic in the industry per episode. Ready to unlock the true power of marketing strategy? In this theme, we'll explore the world of cutting-edge marketing strategies and tactics that are shaking up the SaaS industry. We'll share insights on testing new tactics and uncover the latest developments from digital landscape giants like Google, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We'll also explore how AI is revolutionizing the digital landscape and transforming marketing tactics. So grab your headphones and get ready for a marketing strategy masterclass with Paris Talks Marketing. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Paris Talks Marketing. Today, my guest is Roshan Karyapa. Roshan is an engineer turned founder turned marketer. He has spent the last 15 years with early stage tech startups doing the zero to one across sales, product, and marketing. He heads marketing at Wimo, the sales engagement platform of choice for the world's leading financial institutions. And he also runs the Startup Operator Podcast, which curates wisdom from India's best founders, operators, and investors. He lives in Bangalore with his wife and is a recovering writer and musician in his free time. Roshan, welcome to the show. Hey, Paris. Thanks so much for the invite and excited to be here. It's great to have you. My first question is a common one, which is about a popular myth. And in particular, I want to keep this focused to sales engagement, which is now your area of expertise. What is a popular belief or a myth that you think many people believe related to sales engagement that is simply not true? And can you help us bust that myth? Sure. Uh, let me take a step back and perhaps talk about a popular myth in marketing, and then I'll address the sales engagement uh, bit uh, just after that, right? So with respect to marketing, right, I think we've gone from a world of branded pens and billboards where we kind of threw a bunch of darts in the air and saw what stuck to over-indexing on uh, dashboards, analytics, numbers, and whatnot, which is not to say that, you know, the quantitative is not important. I think definitely very important in understanding what the last mile effectiveness of some of your campaigns and what have you is. But I think we somehow underway or underestimate the qualitative aspects, right? Which is, you know, user anecdotes, customer anecdotes, these conversations that tell you stuff that is in between the lines in terms of how people are actually experiencing value with your product. I think that we're severely underestimating today, I feel. And I think a healthy mix of both the quantitative and qualitative is really helpful. If you ask me personally, I always privilege or prioritize the quality over the quantitative because I having seen numbers, being an engineer for as long and having done a fair bit of product and whatnot, I, I can tell you numbers uh, lie all the time. A bunch of conversations to sort of correlate what's really happening at both ends will help you get to the truth a lot faster. So that is uh, something that is a myth that needs busting for sure. On the same lines, in the CRM world or the sales engagement world, there seems to again be a myth that, you know, more dashboards and more reports are good, right? I mean, it makes for a better platform because you have this detailed analytical reporting to the last mile. And I, I think we have to sort of re-engineer that because if you ask a user of any one of these platforms, whether it is CRM or sales engagement, what's in it for them. There's really nothing. So what we are fundamentally revisiting with Wimo is a simple tenet of give before you ask. You know, before you ask the user to input a bunch of data, can you really tell them what they need to do that could help them uh, be a lot more effective in their work and perhaps, you know, help them meet their quotas and incentives and so on and so forth. So the answer is not always more dashboards and more reports. Uh, the answer could be somewhere more simple, I feel, right? I mean, in terms of nudges and interventions that could actually be useful. 
Yeah, I, I actually think that we're starting to come full circle back to uh, really classic marketing in a sense, because digital marketing for the last, say, maybe 15, 20 years has, has been so incredibly measurable. But yeah. some of these measurement capabilities are, are being taken away, such as th the deprecation of third-party cookies and the I iOS tracking. These are two examples where tracking became much more difficult and attribution became more difficult. And I think in this world, one good rule is to get back to basics and ask customers, hey, how did you hear about us? Or get them to fill that in on a form. Did you come to our website or did you get a referral or whatever it may be? And that qualitative attribution approach, I think, is going to become more and more popular. And it's going to become less of a science and it's going to, the focus is going to shift back to the creative and the messaging, I, I believe. Uh, that's exactly right. I think that's the perfect articulation because I feel, I think also with the quantifiable, there is just a huge focus on attribution, which in my opinion, again, is another thing that needs uh, revisiting, right? Because I feel like first you need to figure out whether you're directionally right and then worry about attribution for the last mile. That is a more sensible approach. And also, I mean, if every last dollar was attributable, then perhaps you're not thinking out of the box enough, right? Perhaps you're thinking very linearly. And when the channel or when the campaign stops working, as you know, even the best channels and best campaigns do, you will be at a loss for ideas. I mean, you won't know what to do. Yeah, I think that attribution, last click attribution still holds up in the world of paid search and demand capture. If you're in a very mature space, let's say it's a category and you're spending all of your marketing dollars on paid search, bottom of funnel, demand capture. And also it's not a product with a big, ACV or a big price tag, but it's something that most people should be converting after the first touch. Then I think you can put stock in last click attribution. But otherwise, most of us B2B marketers are dealing with demand generation and long sales cycles also. And I want to talk about this a little bit more. You all are selling to very large enterprises. Your ACV is, is uh, half a million or more, I, I understand. So these are huge deals, huge ticket sizes, very long sales cycles. Can you talk to me about how a long sales cycle affects how you operate in marketing if you have to wait several months before you see a lead become a customer? Yeah. So let me qualify that a little more. As you rightly mm -hmm. mentioned, our ACVs are upwards of half a million dollars. We sell to mm -hmm. really, really large enterprises and a universe of prospects is very finite. So there could possibly be 100 or 150 accounts in every geography that could be relevant for us. And our sales cycles are long and complex. So which means that there are multiple different decision makers, multiple touch points, many tens, if not hundreds of touch points across the sales cycle. And uh, it could take anywhere between, uh, you know, three to nine months to land one of these accounts. So what does this mean for us at marketing? So the first thing is we can't really generate a lead, maybe convert it into an opportunity and move on. We have to be relevant throughout the life cycle of not just the lead, but also the customer. Because as I mentioned, it's a long, complicated decision making, which means that there is value in multi-threading, for instance, where your inside sales or SDRs find other stakeholders who could be influencers in the deal. There's also things that uh, we could do on the sales acceleration front. I mentioned uh, in our earlier conversation that, uh, you know, we used to use uh, these two minute videos or three minute videos that people could uh, sort of play at their sales meets and whatnot that could explain the value of Wimo and how it could be transformative for our prospect very succinctly. And so, I mean, we have to be involved beyond that. And irrespective of uh, what deal size you close at, there's always more money on the table, right? So how can we 2x or 3x uh, the deal? How can we tangibly affect our NRR? How can we improve NPS? So on and so forth. A conventional marketing team, we can't really you know, generate a lead and leave it into the ether, right? I mean, for sales and the rest of the revenue teams to sort of... Uh, do the rest. I mean, we have to focus on multiple things beyond just leads and opportunities and closure. So second thing, as a result of that, we have to work very closely with our sales and customer teams. I know that sales and marketing alignment is a favorite topic on the podcast. We can delve a little more into how that is at uh, Wimo and what I've learned. But it is a reality. If you have to be more effective, you just have to align with uh, sales and product and customer teams as well. It's not an option for us. We just have to be uh, aligned to be a lot more relevant. I think that's the second thing that I would say is the way that it impacts us. And the third thing is we have to have more of an account-based 
sales approach rather than an account based marketing approach you know, when i'm talking about you know 100 or 150 accounts i really have to go deep within those accounts i need to know what opportunity is there who are the stakeholders what have the interactions been like before what is the blocker so on and so forth right i can't just understand these things at an aggregate level right i have to get down to almost like a contact or an account level conversation on these things and we have run campaigns for a grand target of one right it is still worth it right i mean if it's half a million dollars on the line you can still run those kind of campaigns so this is really account based marketing or account based sales what kind of a content campaign would you run let's say you're targeting a multi billion dollar bank and there's there's got to be maybe 20 different personas or people inside of that organization that you can reach that might influence the decision how would you approach marketing to that individual financial institution excellent question so i would split up my campaigns into two different types of campaigns right so one would be the brand campaign which kind of uh, follows after and the first would be the demand campaigns now for demand campaigns we will still have to run the campaign at an aggregate level right so for instance let's say wimo for insurance agency distribution i mean wimo to transform those particular distribution channel for insurers i will still run that at an aggregate level perhaps take feedback on what people have said before on these particular campaigns to kind of tweak the messaging and what not so here you're talking about let's say about 10 or 15 accounts maybe about 100 stakeholders 150 stakeholders once a percentage of those folks are within the funnel then we start doing some of these middle of the funnel and bottom of the funnel campaigns which are more on the brand side of things which is that it won't have something very transactional like hey click here for a demo or why don't you download this you know ebook or something of that sort it would be a lot more consultative so we run a lot of these case study campaigns and testimonials and so on and so forth to sort of subtly influence these people align their thinking in terms of what our value and what our solution can do for them so those are two types of campaigns that we run further down the funnel the inside sales team becomes the tip of the spear for us the growth team works very closely with the inside sales or the sdr folks to kind of understand what is the challenge uh, articulated challenge or articulated problem statement with each account and then we can potentially run a campaign for one which could be like a workshop that we do with these folks if they're already within the funnel and there are mature opportunity it could be certain reports that we share specific to their use case and situation so on and so forth and to summarize what i meant first these demand campaigns to run at an aggregate level once the leads are within the funnel run some of these middle of the funnel bottom of the funnel campaigns and then finally run the campaign for one particular opportunity or account yeah i i understand how do the leads get in the funnel in the first place is it they're submitting an email to get access to the content Yeah so we do both right i mean we do cold outbound as well which you know we have a unique take on that i can go into that as well and we run these classic demand campaigns which are either webinars or download uh, a particular report so on and so forth you'll notice that it can't be something as straightforward as uh, use wimo or see a, a demo of wimo and so on because ours is not really a transactional product and because there are a lot of touch points we really have to educate our prospects before we actually sell to them right so you can't do a simple click here for a demo kind of a campaign it doesn't work the second thing is i am going to be selling to these guys for many different years right it's not a relationship that is a few weeks old or a few months old i mean i'm going to be selling to these guys for many different years we have you know prospects in our pipeline right now that have been speaking to us for 3 years 4 years just last quarter we converted a, a prospect into a customer who was talking to us for almost 3 years so i need to think slightly long term so the idea is to really educate these people before i can sell to them right and and not just sell i mean i need to solution for them because yes they're going to use a platform at some point of time but why should they use you is something that you need to sort of communicate to them so that is important i'm curious also rashan how many of the people that you're selling to are already using another sales engagement platform or are they even in an earlier stage where they they have a CRM but they don't have anything else and what are the typical stages of these types of banks and insurance companies yeah that's a great question again right because we're in across asia us and japan the marketing and the strategy kind of varies in all of these three different geographies right i mean if you look at india which is not a 
CRM rich market or a CRM mature market. Here, we're mostly addressing folks who haven't even considered something like this, right? Considered a CRM or a, a sales engagement platform. And so here we are completely verticalized end-to-end solution for, let's say, insurance agency or bank assurance or your lending sales or collections or what have you. So we sell a verticalized package solution here. If you look at, for instance, US and Japan, these are CRM mature markets. They're already using either a Salesforce or a Dynamics for many different years. And they recognize that there are certain limitations and they really need a, a system of engagement or a system of insights more specifically. And, and so they've already been kind of primed to consider something like Waymo. And so here ours is more of a problem solution kind of a approach. In these cases, we look at folks who are using a Salesforce for a while now. Typically, what we notice is if someone has just deployed a CRM, they're not really ready enough for something like a WIMO. So if they're Mm -hmm. using CRM for maybe three years or four years, and if let's say our annual is coming up and so on, a quarter before that is when they're absolutely right. Quarter or two quarters before that is when they're absolutely right for the talking, at least to start those initial conversations. So that is when we we reach out to them and start positioning WIMO. That's an interesting distinction that you mentioned that maturity of these markets vary greatly. So in India, a lot of them, a lot of these banks, maybe they don't even have a CRM. They certainly don't have a sales engagement platform. They may be using spreadsheets or some other form, but you're really educating them about a sales engagement platform. And you could possibly onboard them onto WIMO before they even get a CRM, right? And this could be an all-in-one solution. Whereas more mature markets, like you mentioned, the US and Japan too likely, these institutions surely have a CRM. Probably they're on Salesforce, or they might be on on something else. Yeah. Probably have been using it for maybe decades. They may or may not have a sales engagement platform, but maybe they do. So in those cases, you're either competitive selling against their existing sales engagement platform, or you're trying to convince them that the addition of a sales engagement platform to their CRM would be a good move. Am I correct? Roughly. Yeah, that's approximately right. In the case when they're using a sales engagement platform, we notice that the sales engagement platform is solving a very focused problem, like one siloed problem for them, right? They still need something like a single pane of glass that can be their system of engagement that can tie all of this data together and offer them meaningful insights and nudges and so on and so forth. In that case, I mean, we kind of integrate with whatever they have to sort of be that uh, single pane of glass. So that's just one of those differences, right? Again, between US and Japan itself, there is a, a lot of differentiation just in terms of the culture, how they use software, what their expectations are, and so on and so forth. So, for instance, in Japan, they like their software like they like their bridges or roads or buildings and so on. They want it to be done. And they're happy using that version of the product until when they recognize that, you know, they perhaps need something different which could even be better. But in the US, I noticed that it's a lot more aspirational. You're always thinking about the latest things that you can incorporate and so on and so forth. Simply these two kind of mindsets will require us to sort of communicate and market to them differently. Yeah. Do you market in Japanese, in the Japanese language to Japan? Yes, we have a Japan marketing team as well. So it's completely localized and not just in Japan, right? I mean, even in places like Indonesia, for example, where they are comfortable with English, but then, you know, there are certain aspects that we have to market in Bahasa for them. And similarly with uh, Vietnam and Thailand and so on. Yeah, really interesting. And how has it been particularly, I know that your base is in India. So how has it been the international expansion? How challenging is that to, to go out of your home market? and build a brand where you don't have the recognition. And I don't know, some people may also have preconceived notions about you coming in from India, perhaps, or what are some of the challenges that you face taking it from India global? So we're headquartered in uh, San Francisco. We've been that way for about five years now, since 2019, post our Series B. We're a global company. Similarly, we have local offices in Japan, in parts of uh, Southeast Asia and India. We started out of India, but we're fairly global right now. We have general managers for Asia, Japan, and the US. We have localized teams as well, fully staffed for both, you know, the customer facing staff as well as, you know, some of the engineering aspects as well. So I feel like we're sufficiently global at this point of time. And it's been an interesting journey, you know, because I've done the zero to one across these geographies and no two geographies are the same. One thing that I've 
very quickly realized is that you have to shed your baggage you have to think from first principles uh, for every geography it's easy to so- sort of walk into a geography and think that you know 40 or 50 large enterprises using you already but all of that doesn't mean anything for the, those people in that geography right i mean that mm-hmm. might perhaps get you in the door but then after that for everything else you really have to demonstrate value and you have to understand their context you know financial enterprises 50 60 percent of it is pretty much the same everywhere in the world i would uh, say right i mean the way cards are sold in india or perhaps the way cards are sold in the us as well but really you know you have to meaningfully contextualize for that particular market and that has been our greatest learning expanding to these geographies yeah one geography that's noticeably absent from your footprint is europe is there a reason why you're not going after europe you got asia north america we've had inbound from uh, europe actually we've had inbound from uh, a lot of the insurance firms there and in fact bank assurance which is one of our key solution areas is more relevant in uh, europe uh, than in the us i mean it isn't there in the us somehow we've taken a strategic call to sort of prioritize us right after so who knows i mean uh, we might be there in a couple of years this time if things uh, go as per plan okay yeah when you're targeting industries that are so specific like insurance the channel that comes to mind would be linkedin both from organic and paid standpoints, because you can target people in the insurance industry. But let's talk a bit about channels. Are you all using LinkedIn heavily? And and if so, how do you approach LinkedIn for for the account-based marketing? We're using LinkedIn, but I'm a very reluctant uh, user of LinkedIn. I mean, it's it's done fabulously well for us. We get a, a bunch of these leads and we're able to brand our solution to very specific stakeholders and so on. But my meta goal is to reduce my LinkedIn spend by about 50-60% over the next year and a half, two years. Because I do notice that the platforms are monopolistic anyway. So Google and LinkedIn kind of extract their pound of flesh and more. So we have looked at, you know, affiliate channels, for instance, trade publications, local media outlets, trade shows, for instance, which have done, you know, really well for us. I mean, Think of your 100% meetup or 150% meetup where you can have an intimate conversation with 10 or 15 of your prospects and uh, won't cost you much, right? I mean, cost you a few thousand bucks. That seems to work out uh, really well for us a lot of the times. Of course, I mean, we rely on LinkedIn like any other B2B marketing firm, but very reluctantly and planning to reduce our spend on paid acquisition as much as possible and, and focus on more real world channels, I would say. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. The Paris Talks Marketing Show is affiliated with Hop Online, a performance marketing agency focused on high-growth SaaS and other recurring revenue-based companies. If you like the flow of this conversation, you may want to consider jumping on a discovery call with someone at Hop Online. A discovery call is similar to my podcast interviews in a lot of ways. We'll get to know your business goals, competitive landscape, and marketing needs. And you'll almost certainly come away with some new ideas for how to accelerate your customer and revenue growth. If you're interested, go to hop.online, that's hop, H-O-P dot online, and book a discovery call with one of our strategists today. Now, back to the episode. So let's make a pivot over to AI, because we really can't not mention this now, practically in any kind of strategy discussion. What is your approach to AI at Wimo? How are you and the teams using it? And what do you see as the future for AI for marketing? So I am an eternal technology optimist. I am not a fan of uh, Black Mirror type of scenarios. I mean, in fact, I have seen the role technology has played and like lifting people out of their social and economic uh, circumstances around me. So I am a very, very big fan of the possibilities with uh, any new technology, right? So on, on that same note, my fear about AI disrupting marketing is less about people not having jobs or let's say copywriters being out of work because AI will generate all of that magic copy by themselves. It's less about all of that stuff and more about, you know, making us a lot more complacent. I I think what it really means is that our value as humans, we really have to upskill and upgrade ourselves. I don't know who said this, the jobs that AI will take away isn't all of those people that I mentioned, not the copywriters and so on. I mean, but Really, the people who are using AI will take away jobs of those who are not using AI, I I feel. So, I mean, as Waymo, we have always had this conviction that we need to give the user something before they ask. So, give before you ask is a core tenet of our product building, which is why when the world was thinking about dashboards and reports and so on, which is 
more post hoc anal- analysis of what has happened we were thinking about nudges and interventions which is more predictive so rather than have a retrospective outlook we had a proactive outlook to things you know it just opens up a lot more possibilities but directionally we have always been thinking on those lines so from a product perspective it's more of an extension rather than a change in direction for us and in your marketing team do you all use chat gpt or other tools to feed up the work or to generate ads landing page copy or other things yeah we've used a bunch of tools i mean we've used jasper for instance and chat gpt for a great first version of pr releases and so on and so forth we've also kind of used this to understand more about our users and prospects right i mean with ai i don't really have to look at all of the 40 reports that are there right i mean whether it's the consumer banking survey or some state of insurance sales and so on and so forth with ai i can glean from those reports what is meaningfully relevant for me so those are two ways that we've used it but yeah i mean i'm yet to be completely bowled over by something that ai can do at this point of time yeah you think that the end customer most of your biggest clients and customers are insurance companies and their customers are the consumers and right now most people would go to google for an insurance quote But do you think in the future they might go to ChatGPT to get an insurance quote for, say, I don't know, car insurance or homeowners insurance? And if so, how could an insurance company reach them there in that experience? It's already happening, you know, with embedded finance and embedded insurance. The insurance sale has become a lot more seamless. So, like they say, insurance is bought, not sold. With insurers being a lot more proactive on that front, I think it's already happening. I mean if if you think about it like a general purpose chatbot which will understand your financial social needs and can proactively you know suggest products and so on is, is perhaps in the making right i mean in some sense your alexa is basically that i mean sort of a primitive version of that so that's already going to happen i think yeah yeah that's going to be fascinating because now those answers are coming out and they're not really attributing the content to a particular source or a brand so If I'm a, an insurance company and I'm creating a lot of content and that content eventually is going to get served through these personalized chat experiences but without attributing to my brand I could be helping to generate demand not for my brand but for for someone else's really so that's a real risk actually if these institutions yeah I I think there are a few of these open questions I mean whether it's in terms of what data sets they can use to make these predictions or what they can and cannot do and so on right i mean surely some of the things that they have to adjudicate on the policy side are like really difficult questions i wouldn't want to be the one making that they have far reaching consequences on humanity let's hope that it's a more bottom up approach and not like very top down at that so that if there are any adverse consequences i mean we can kind of fix them on the go and it won't cause a lot of harm so that's what i would hope for yeah yeah i imagine that most of those institutions the larger ones really don't even allow their employees to use generative ai yet uh, like chat gpt yeah But, i mean w- one thing that i i did in an experiment that was uh, pretty fun and i asked chat gpt to to create micro personas of insurance companies so i got a lot of cool answers one thing that i i think has been really helpful is even at the early strategy stage to take a large sector like let's say insurance different insurance agencies that might specialize in auto insurance, home insurance, and then there's other, like a dozen others probably. But this gave me a great starting point for segmenting that market. And then from the segmentation you can build out positioning and messaging that's unique to each segment. No, I think it can certainly complement your approach, but I would still want to have those 100 conversations before I do any of these things, right? I understand if you've already had those 50 or 60 or 100 conversations, you might want to like we some of these other perspectives if you have missed it due to your selective bias or whatever but you know i'm a, a very big fan of having these conversations first and then complementing it through technology and so on yeah yeah I, i hear you well this has been great roshan what what else did, have i not asked you that you wish that i would have asked you or what else do you think could benefit our audience No, I think you covered pretty much all of the bases and uh, this was a great conversation. I, mean, I I think you know when people talk about B2B marketing they generally think of SMBs, they think of HubSpot and what not, but the enterprise marketing is a whole other animal and yeah, marketing can add a lot of value. Jason Lemkin, who is uh, the founder of SaaS often says that enterprise marketing is not just about branded blue pens, 
are organizing a dream force once a year there's a lot more going on there and i would just direct people to study some of these larger enterprise companies and look at their marketing there's some fabulous stuff happening there yeah hey one thing that i i did catch in your bio is that you're a recovering writer and and musician can you tell me a little bit about that before we wrap up yeah i mean uh, i was 25 i was uh, writing songs and uh, recording albums and it was a great time i had to sort of make a decision at that point of time if i wanted money or music and i kind of chose the former a bunch of my friends went to music school and i just saw how much of a challenge it was for them to sort of you know survive in the real world and i thought i couldn't do that at that point but yeah i mean i dream of uh, someday going back to that life hopefully soon Yeah, I noticed the guitar behind you there. I could see just the oh, handle, yeah. the handle of it. So, do you still pick it up and play from time to time? Sometimes, not often. I still have song ideas and so on that I kind of put down sometimes, but yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the, the music helps you keep the creative juices flowing and that I think that helps you not only in marketing but in all types of other work too. Oh, for sure. For sure. I I really I'm a big fan of creativity under constraints. So, I sometimes put myself through these exercises where I say that I'm going to write about a particular thing and in this particular format and just challenge myself to come up with different things. It's a great exercise. I think people should do that. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next on the horizon for Waymo? We're pretty excited about our US growth as well as Japan in fact. So we're starting to see demand be pretty much steady after the last 3 years of start stop due to all of this the pandemic and then the slowdown and what not. we're starting to see a steady demand right now and we're having very interesting conversations with our prospects in asia we're organizing our customer event in june so that is something that i'm personally excited for it should be a great event hopefully the first of many to follow so yeah i mean very excited for all of the demand that's happening and over the last 7 or 8 years i think we've made the case for why sales engagement and particularly sales engagement for financial institutions is important we're seeing so many different changes happen that kind of has validated all of that and you know i think the time is now for us to sort of scale yeah i think so in the us all i hear now is strong economic news and i think that the year that we've just started it's going to be a good one and i think confidence is coming back and when that happens the spending comes back and you know all good things happen from there absolutely i think you know in the bad times people are way too pessimistic and in the good times people are way too optimistic i feel but it's always like good to have an even keel about these things neither the good times nor the bad times last and so yeah hopefully the good times return yeah and actually one of the most resilient and i guess non seasonal industries that i can think of is insurance because in the good times you pay your insurance and in the bad times you pay your insurance it's not really a discretionary spending let's say so th- those companies are more resilient than recession proof than in a lot of other industries so that makes selling software into those industries also more stable and that gives you the ability to take a longer term approach and to go after these huge whales like you're going after and have have that patience yeah that's a great point because i wouldn't say we haven't been affected by the slowdown and the pandemic i mean obviously we have but not to the degree that some of these other saas companies selling to saas companies have been affected right so the fact that we're selling into a very essential part of the economy ha- has meant that you know our ups and downs are, are within a particular range right tolerable range i would say right right excellent well roshan this has been a lot of fun and thank you for spending the time with me yeah. tell me in our audience where can people find you online where is the best place yeah so i am active on uh, linkedin and twitter i am roshan karyapa on uh, both of these so yeah i'd love to connect with you folks and uh, let me know if you disagreed with something i would love to debate this and like you know understand your perspective as well so yeah very keen on that great thanks for the conversation roshan thanks paris thanks so much for the opportunity and i hope you found this uh, useful another great episode in the books hope you enjoyed it if you want to get notified when future episodes drop be sure to subscribe to paris talks marketing on your favorite podcast player and to learn more about our growth marketing agency visit hop.online that's hop h o p .online have a great day